Shaker furniture is typically characterized as being very plain and devoid of ornamentation. However, simple shapes like coves, roundovers, and cyma curves frequently appear in shaker pieces. Such is the case with this bench. The original had cyma curves cut on the ends of each of the four stretchers and a half round cutout at the bottom of the leg. For our version, we're going to make one little change from the original. We're going to keep the cyma curves at the ends of each of the four stretchers, but instead of a half round at the bottom of the leg, I'm going to do another set of cyma curves. And the only reason I made this change is to provide a little bit more sawing practice with turning saws so that you can get some work changing directions. And the cyma curves allow us to do that. But if you'd rather stay true to the original, feel free to change the design and just do a half round cutout at the bottom of the legs. To lay out the curves on your pieces, you have several different options. If you don't care much about the actual radius of the curve, one of the simplest ways to lay out the curve is just to trace around a tin can. Just draw a diagonal line on your piece at the angle that you want your cyma curve to be at. This one's a little bit less than 45 degrees. And then all you have to do is trace the actual curve. If you line up the can with the end point and the center mark, trace around the can, you can get yourself a nice connecting curve. Now this is probably the simplest way, but of course the radius of your curve is limited by the radius of your can. Another option is to use a set of circle templates or French curves from the art store, but even these have their limitations regarding your control over the radius of the curve. My preference is to use a compass because I can infinitely adjust this radius to whatever I need and I can control the radius um, and make it proportional to the size of the curve that I'm making and not have to try to find giant size cans or giant size circle templates when I'm trying to make larger size curves. Um, and my preference in dividers for this particular task is what's called a loose leg divider because I can remove one leg of this and replace it with a pencil. Now, as the name implies, a loose leg divider has one leg that is not permanently affixed to the frame. If I loosen this thumb screw, I can remove the loose leg and replace it with a pencil to make a pencil compass. And the benefit of this, other than versatility, will be obvious in just a second. So we'll start by cutting out the detail on the bottom of the leg. Now this double cyma curve detail is sometimes referred to as a boot jack. So I'll start by setting the combination square to two inches. And I'm going to make a mark two inches in from either side of the leg. This is going to define the width of the feet. Now I need to split this distance in half. I could just measure with a ruler, but if the distance ends up some weird dimension between sixteenths or thirty seconds, it becomes kind of a pain. So the easiest thing to do is just to step it off with a divider. And as you'll see, if you can get close, it only takes one or two tries to step that off. Small adjustments. Now I have this almost exactly in half. There. I'll leave a little dimple. And that's my center line. Now I'm going to draw a line straight up from that center. Ideally, you want to do this 
from the side, but my bottom edge is square enough that I'm comfortable with that. And I'm going to set this for four inches. And I'm going to come up four inches from the bottom and make my tick mark there. Now I'm going to connect those lines, those tick marks, with my diagonal line. And this is going to define the angle that my SIMA curve is going to follow. Now with those diagonals established, I want to now find the center point of the diagonal. You can do the same thing. I'm too wide, so we'll close down a little. Still a little too wide. A little too narrow now, so we'll Use my little fine adjustment and open that up. There. There's my exact center point of that line, which should also be the exact center point of that one as well. Right there. Now you have a choice. You have to decide what the radius of your curve wants to be. If you want a radius that will end up looking something like this, set your compass to be this half distance here, half the width of the line, and that's going to be the radius that you swing for your circle. If this is too curvy for you and you like to flatten it out, try opening your compass up to maybe three quarters or make maybe opening it up to the full length of this line. That's how you're going to control the radius of your circle. What I'm going to do now that I have my center point established is I'm going to switch out to the pencil. Now what you can see is I haven't changed my radius at all. The setting is still the same and I can just switch out to a pencil so I don't have to set a separate compass I'm already there. In fact, I do have to change because pencil is a different thickness. So there you go. All right. So now with this all set, I'm going to swing a couple of arcs. Now I want the curve here to come in and up. So I need to make my center point somewhere over here. So if I swing an arc from the center of that line and from this point here, do the same thing on this side. Those two arcs create an intersection that becomes the center point for this part of the curve. And if you get that center point just right, that curve will meet at the center point, center of this line, and the tip right there. So again, put this right on the center where those two arcs crossed. Scribe that line. Now on the bottom, I'm going to need a scrap. So I'm just going to use one of my stretchers here. You get one that'll. It's a little cleaner so you can see a little better because this is going to end up being uh, the center points are going to be somewhere down here because these we want these to swing up this way so we're going to need to establish a center point for that arc and that is probably going to be somewhere down here off the board And this one can be a little bit persnickety to get the point just right on the end of that board. And you can see that that center point is going to be scribed just off the edge of that board. It's going to be the same situation here. And the trick with this is to make sure that 
this board doesn't move. So you kind of want to make sure, I just moved it, you want to kind of hold that in place. Now, same thing, put on your center point there. Describe your curve in this direction. Center point here. Describe your curve in this direction. Now we can cut those sima curves out. And to saw out the curve, you can use a coping saw, the same saw that we used earlier to saw out the notches for the joinery. Uh, or if you have one, you can use a little bit larger hand saw for curves like this turning saw. Now I'm going to be using the turning saw just because the teeth are larger, the blade is larger and longer, and it's just more aggressive and faster cutting. If all you have is a coping saw, the coping saw will work just fine. I'm going to use this so that you don't have to watch me move along at a snail's pace with a blade that's super fine because my coping saw blade has super fine teeth. If you're going to use your coping saw to make cuts in thick stock like this for curves, for joinery, any blade will work just fine because it's small short cuts. But for larger, thicker stock like this and longer curves, I'm going to suggest that you get a coping saw blade that has much coarser teeth than you would typically find in a hardware store coping saw blade. Companies like Tools for Working Wood will sell coping saw blades in lots of different tooth counts. Get an aggressive tooth count if you're going to use a coping saw for cutting thick stock like this. I'm going to go ahead and use my turning saw so that we can move along a little quicker. So the first thing I want to do is take my square and lay this curve out across the end grain. Because getting this saw started square to the face of the board is really critical in getting a nice square cut. Get it started square and it'll tend to stay square. So using a turning saw is no different than using a regular saw. I'm going to use my thumb to get the saw started and saw without sawing to get, get the cut started. Now you can use these saws two-handed or one-handed. Sometimes two-handed works a little better for control. Get to this transition point I want to slow down because I need to make a wide enough curve for my saw to change direction so I'm going to kind of saw in place not really moving the saw forward much while I gently twist the saw that's going to open the curve up a little bit and allow me to change direction Once you finish this cut, you have two choices. You can leave the cut as is, or you can clean it up uh, with some other tools. Now on many old pieces, if not most old pieces, a cut like this would have just been left alone. 
it's on the bottom of the piece. It sits close to the floor. And when viewed from typical angle above, you'll never see this cut surface. If you really want to clean this cut edge up, you can use some 80 or 120 grit sandpaper wrapped around a flat stick for the convex areas or wrapped around a dowel for the concave areas. For my piece, I'm just going to leave it alone. I may just lightly sand the corners a little bit when we get to the finishing stage, but I'm not going to worry about cleaning up the actual saw cuts because the real focus of this course is on practicing the sawing, not so much the project. So we're using the project to practice sawing. We're not going to worry about fussing too much about cleaning up this cut as long as the cut is nice and continuous and, and straight, which I was able to do in this case. But again, if you want to refine your curve a little bit, if you're not so happy with the, the cut and you want to refine it a little bit, take some 180, uh, sorry, 120 or 80 grit sandpaper on a dowel, clean up those concave areas and on a flat stick, kind of like a, making your own file or rasp and clean up the convex areas. Of course, if you have a file or a rasp or card scraper, you can use that as well. But again, this course, we're focusing on minimal tools, just working on sawing. So we're not going to take this any further than we already have. The layout process for the Sima curve on the ends of the stretchers is very similar to what we just did for the leg. So I'll just go through it really quickly. So the process starts just like the legs with establishing our diagonal. So I'm going to come up two and three quarters of an inch. In this case, I don't want 45 degrees. If I wanted 45 degrees, I could just come in two and three quarters of an inch, but I'm going to go for more of a flat layout. So I'm going to use a four to three ratio. So step off three steps here. So we have three steps tall and I'm going to make this four steps wide. There's one, two, whoops, one, two, three, one more time, one, two, three, four. And I'm going to put a tick mark there and we'll connect those with our diagonal line. Now I want to divide that in half. Just a little more. Good. There's our halfway point. For this curve here, oh, let's switch out to our pencil. Actually, you know what? We don't even have to switch out to our pencil, really. So for this curve, we'll just make a light scratch there. We'll make a light scratch here. For this one, as I mentioned before, we'll need a little scrap, just like before. This time that scrap's going to be along the edge. So I'll make a little scratch mark there. A little scratch mark. Come on. There. And we can use that center line and draw that. Use this point here and scratch in that. Let's, I'll darken that in so you can see it. So as you can see, these curves are just a little bit flatter than the curves we did with our tin can. And we could make them flatter still if we wanted to by just opening up this divider and using a wider radius. And the process 
for sawing out the stretchers is exactly the same as what we did for sawing out the legs. And if you just take your time and you aren't in a rush to get this done, you should be able to follow a line with a turning saw just as precisely as you can follow a straight line with a well-tuned handsaw. Now just like with the legs, it's up to you whether you want to clean up the sawn edge or not. Just like the legs, this surface is going to face the floor and isn't really going to be seen in the finished piece. However, it does sit up quite a bit higher on the bench and a sitter that's using the bench may reach under and grab it and feel the rough sawn edge. So you might want to consider smoothing this one out even if you didn't do so for the legs. I'm going to go ahead and do so with my stretchers, not just for that tactile experience, but because once it is smoothed out, I can then use that first one as a template and just trace the pattern onto my other stretchers and not have to repeat the compass layout on every single one. So once everything's all cut out and sanded, it's time for a little bit of dry assembly. We can start to see what this final bench is actually going to look like. So that's looking pretty good. Other than a few minor adjustments to the tops of the stretchers to get them nice and even with the top of the leg so everything fits nice and tight, I think this bench is just about ready for assembly.